everyone. Thanks for joining today. We are super excited to have Alex Iskold here to lead this session on how startups can utilize funnels and the concept of the magic moment. Um, Alex is the managing partner of um, two, 2048 Ventures and also an HBS EIR. He was previously the managing director of Techstars New York, was the founder and CEO of Get Glue, and also the founder and CEO of Information Laboratory, as well as the chief architect at Data Synapse. Um, so with that, um, I'll turn it over to Alex to get us started. Thanks, Alex. Perfect. Well, thank you. Thank you, as, as always, for having me. I'm always excited to come back and and uh, and and talk talk about funnels and magic moment. Um, couple of things before before we get before we get started. Um, I would love for you guys to feel free to please interrupt me at any time. Um, this is your time, and I want to make sure that you get the most out of it. So. Obviously, these things are much better in person, but we'll, you know, we're all accustomed to Zoom. So please don't be shy. Um, what, what, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause and prompt you for questions. But also, I can't really see all of you on on the screen. So I I take no offense if you just start shouting. So if you have a question at any point, just start speaking. Totally fine by me. And then obviously. Um, you can put questions into the chat um, or, or raise your hand. And so let's let's make sure there's various ways and opportunities for you to, um, uh, you know, to get the most out of the session. Also, if you, um, uh, you know, have post-session questions uh, specific to your startup, if you want to ask me something specific about your funnel or uh, your magic moment, my inbox is always open, so you can reach me at alex at 2048vc. So with that, um, you know, I'm always happy to do a couple of signature workshops. Uh, obviously, I do one on fundraising, but I actually think that the topic of funnels and magic moment doesn't really get enough attention, yet it's so critical, because really, uh, this isn't only a toolbox for you guys. To, to do something very meaningful with your startup, it truly strikes at the heart of what it means to build a sustainable business. And so that's why I'm so nerdy and so passionate about the topic. So let, let, let's get into it. The talk um, itself consists of uh, two separate bits. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff relevant to funnels uh, and sort of a generic tool that you can use for your startup in many contexts. And then there is, sort of the ultimate funnel, which is the magic moment uh, that I want to talk to you about. So um, funnels are basically everywhere. Um, you know, anything you look at within the startup is some sort of a funnel. And what they look like is they're just basically these inverted pyramids where we start with a lot on the top, end up with less on the bottom. And I'm sure all of you have thought about, you know, a website sign up as a funnel. Uh, sales naturally is a funnel. Fundraising is a funnel. You start with a whole slew of potential investors, then you end up with people who actually give you a check. Uh, recruiting is a funnel, et cetera. Um, so um, you understand that, like, let, you know, we'll look at like a few examples, but like here's a typical uh, B2C funnel. You start with somebody who is visiting your website potentially for the first time, they may or may not go through a sign up process, then they get activated. Somehow you assume that they performed a gesture that was of interest, then they may become engaged over time. If they keep coming back to your website or your, to your app, they're retained. And then somehow you in the end monetize them and something really interesting happens towards the bottom. I mean, hopefully you turn uh, isn't significant and hopefully your lifetime value of a customer is bigger than CAD, but ultimately a business for it to be viable has to solve these equations. And that's what we're going to, that's what we're going to be, uh, that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, obviously another type of funnel would be an investor funnel, uh, where you start with the universe of all investors, which is hundred percent not right for you. Uh, there is then a subset of qualified investors. Uh, then, you know, 
first meeting happens, then some other things happen. It really is nuanced and depends on whether you're dealing with an angel investor, uh, an angel group, or you're dealing with someone more sophisticated like a venture capital firm. Um, and then obviously it's nice when you get through the process, you get a commitment and then you get, you get, you get money in the bank. But again, it's a funnel and at every stage uh, there is a potential drop off. Um, so one of the articles that I wrote is you can actually think of your entire startup as a funnel. And that's a, that's a very helpful, uh, that's a very help, helpful visual. I mean, when you think about it, what are we doing here as founders? We're trying to convert people who've never met you before into diehard fans. That's what great businesses are, right? Like they sort of take uh, a universe of people who've never met you and then through some magic, which, which involves product, uh, customer success, and then uh, skills like sales and marketing. And then, uh, you know, you basically end up with something valuable. The thing that's really important to note is that the foundations of a startup isn't really sales and marketing, meaning if your product isn't needed and if you can't retain your customers, which is what customer success is for, you can't build a big business. So really um, think about it this way. Uh, customer success is the sort of critical piece upon which the product sits. And it only makes sense to pour gasoline on the fire meaning step on the guest with sales and marketing once you nail that. And so as we study funnels and rules of funnels, um, it's really important to think about sequencing and what comes first here. So if effectively, if you cannot build a product that people like and want, and if you cannot build a product that retains customers, does not matter how much sales and marketing money you have. Okay, I'm gonna pause any questions on what we've talked about so far. Okay, I'm gonna keep rolling. So next, I wanna give you guys a bunch of tools. They're effectively rules of funnels and some of them are pretty counterintuitive. So the first rule is that you always should optimize the funnel from bottom up. So remember what I just told you. First, you need to make sure you retain customers. Then you need to make sure your product is awesome. Then you need to pour gasoline on the fire and scale up your sales and marketing. You see what I'm doing? I am doing it in reverse. Uh, a lot of times founders say, hey, I just wish I had more top of the funnel. But I always ask, is your bottom of the funnel strong? Are you retaining customers? Do you really know that your product is needed? So. The first rule is you have to start on the bottom. Uh, and remember, like YC is very famous for saying kind of like a couple of uh, things that sort of became uh, truisms in the startup industry. Build something people want. Like, why are they saying that? Well, they're saying that for obvious reason because product is the kind of the bottom of that, of that funnel. Um, now, they also say things like do the unscalable thing. And that's actually a really important uh, thing in connection with funnels. The unscalable thing means try to sell your early product. By all means, uh, this means you're spending time on the bottom of that funnel. When you're doing the unscalable thing, you're making sure that you can get a few early customers for whom your product is resonating. Um, so remember this, you walk backwards from the bottom of the funnel to the top. Now, you know, if you look at uh, a typical B2C funnel, your main risk is actually not retaining customers. So think about your own behavior when it comes to apps. How much time do you afford to a new app? Like you've heard from a friend that, app xyz is good for blah 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 you literally go to the app store you go to the website you download it and then you just click 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 and then you're out um, and then you're not coming back so effectively you're you're you you are uh, not retained 
Now, if I, as an app developer, spend money on the marketing and driving you to that funnel, and then you've gone through the whole thing, and then you simply left, and that's it, I just wasted a lot of money. So let me give you a um, very contrived visual. Let's say we launched the startup together, and we've built this amazing website. It's super useful. It doesn't matter what it's about. And then... Um, I coded it and I forgot to add an interaction. For, I, I forgot to attach code to the sign up button. So literally you have all these people coming to the website and there's a bug. You click the sign up and it's simply broken. It does nothing. I mean, that's obviously a super silly example, but it illustrates the point. The point is people can't use the product and th therefore everything else is a mute point. So the bottom of the funnel is broken. The conversion is broken. Um, so effectively, if you have a weak bottom of the funnel, you have what's known colloquially as a leaky bucket. Uh, you have a bucket with a bunch of holes in it. And if you keep pouring water, uh, it doesn't retain it. The water still flows out. So that's what's known in the industry as a leaky bucket. It's a product that effectively fails the MVP test. And by the way, I encourage you guys to go to my website and read a blog post on, on MVPs. Um, it's actually really tricky, especially if you're building an enterprise product. The viability part of an MVP is very, very hard because to build a product that is viable uh, for an enterprise takes a while. And so what ends up happening is and what you often hear from people, just launch quickly, just launch quickly. Well, guess what? I don't know if that's a good advice. I mean, you certainly want to get feedback from the customers, but when you launch quickly, you may be running an experiment that's flawed and you're getting the wrong signal. I launched something quickly, but it wasn't sufficient. It wasn't sophisticated enough for people to use it. And so, what have you learned? You've learned that you haven't built enough features. And so it's complicated. The viability of an MVP is a really important piece to consider. So TLDR, the reason you optimize funnels bottom up is because you want to make sure that um, you have really strong bottom of the funnel, that you don't have a leaky bucket before you start optimizing everything else. I'm going to pause again to see if you guys have any questions. And I, I also, I can't really see the chat. So if there's any questions in the chat, please let me know. Good. Okay. I'm going to keep rolling. Um, so um, the second rule is really more focused on uh, go for it, Christian. Hi. How about when you have a um, you don't you're not an MVP yet? People are asking for traction. I mean, like let's say I have a product, have uh, just a UX prototype. Can't really get anyone to use it. I mean, I could show it to you. You could see how cool it is. I mean, it's not the full product. I mean, yeah. What what what's the question? How would you, uh, investors will say, oh, you know, what's your traction? And you're like, well, I have a UX Pro, it's up, so I have zero traction. But then maybe I could get people to like, give me opinions about what the UX prototype is to them. Is that considered traction? Or that's just called user testing? I mean, yeah, well, that's my question. It's an open-ended question. I mean, I wouldn't call it traction, but I do think your point is important in this context. So one of my favorite way of de-risking product is not writing code but creating pictures. And so you can build a clickable prototype or you can build a picture and show it to someone and get a better idea of whether, you know, whether they would be interested or not. And by the way, that de-risks, that type of bottom of the funnel activity that's, that's de-risking it. So another type of bottom of the funnel activity is the second rule called conditions to close. And it's really important, especially for you guys, those of you who, are selling enterprise products. So the worst possible thing that happens, and it happened to me many times, happened to a lot of founders, is that you keep spending time talking to people, and then in the end, um, 
you actually cannot close the sale for silliest possible reason. Like people don't have a budget. You're talking to the wrong person. Um, you don't, you know, they, they never intended to purchase. Um, you know, they engaged into a trial, but the conditions to um, define what constitutes successful trial were incorrect. So million things and in real world, they're very nuanced and very complicated. So how do you as a founder ensure that you don't waste time? Well, you don't really know uh, all even steps in the funnel and all of these conditions. So the only tool you have at your disposal is at every stage, at every conversation, you need to reconfirm and you need to use what's known ref as reflective listening um, to to basically reduce the risk and to understand the conditions to close. So the first meeting you have with someone, you basically say, hey, um, this is the price for my product. What, what's your budget? Does it fit within your budget? Who is the economic buyer who signs off on the, on the sale? Who is the champion? Who is the product buyer? Um, you know, do you, do you, you know, are you evaluating other competitive products? Do you intend to make a purchase this year? Think of like a laundry list of these questions, right? And then you need to ask them and reaffirm them every single time. And you need to use reflective listening to basically confirm that you're hearing it correctly. If this sounds slightly silly, it is not. It is actually what uh, all good salespeople do to make sure that you're not going to waste your time because the worst situation is when you're spending so much time on the customer and then for whatever silly reason the deal just does not close um so understanding conditions to close and reaffirming them at every stage of the funnel so with the fundraising funnel the situation is similar and this is so painful for founders um you know the first instinct, especially you, you guys are at Harvard, every single investor is probably going to want to talk to you, right? And historically, founders uh, that come out of HBS have advantage in capital raising. It's typically smoother compared to, you know, uh, other founders, but still founders tend to waste time with wrong investors. So who is the wrong investor? Well, a wrong investor is someone who ultimately has no intention of investing in you. So example, um, you know, it could be very later stage growth firm that sends an analyst who is trying to create a market map and that individual wants to talk to you and they're just gathering knowledge. There is no path for you guys to raise capital. But if you, if you don't know, you may continue to talk to them. Now, a, a, a more important version is like, you're not talking to the decision maker at the firm. Uh, and it gets really complex. In some firms, it's really hard to tell how decisions are made. Some partnerships are vote-based. Some partnerships, individuals can push the deals through. In some part, in most partnerships, junior people cannot do deal. Um, you know, then there is another weirdo, which is what I call a zombie VC fund. It's a fund that either uh, has no capital because they're at the tail end of this fund when they're in the process of raising the next one, or they're just a first time fund and um, just have no capital to invest. Now, the weirdest thing is they would still meet with you. Now, you may be wondering why. Well, because they're trying to use you to raise capital, which is completely counterintuitive because they want to go to their investors and say, hey, I met this really cool company. And if you give me money, I will give them money. Um, and then obviously all kinds of other things like they have a competitive investment. Um, you know, there's, there's other nuances. I don't want to dwell too much on this other than you guys before engaging investors really need to think hard. Is this the right investor for me? Um, and that's, that's understanding conditions to close because you as a founder, if you keep talking to investors that are ultimately not going to invest in you, you are wasting time. Um, I'm going to pause to see if there's any questions on this. 
Okay. Um, hi, Alex. Quick question. What does having capacity essentially mean? Okay, so this is like the weirdest of them all. But when you guys are dealing with the later stage funds, um, uh, it is not true about 2048 Ventures, but it is true with, we, we are a smaller fund and we specialize in seed and pre-seed. But when you get to um, large institutional funds, each partner, like at Bessemer, for example, may not be on more than like 15 boards. In the old days, it used to be 10. And so here's the weird part. When you go to the website of a fund, that's a later stage fund. You can kind of look at every partner and see how many deals she's in, how many deals he's in. And you can kind of triangulate to basically see, oh, wow, like this partner has a ton of deals. So weirdly enough, the probability of that partner investing in you is that much lower because um, sitting on boards is actually work. We can argue whether investors add value on boards or not. That's a separate argument we can have, but um, it certainly is work for the investors. And so investor may be more reluctant to sign up for a new board if they already are on other boards. And I see there's another question. And see? Yes. Um, when an investor does reach out, because now some of our startups are public on the HBS website, I guess, should we take the call. I, I, I know you're saying before that you that, that you might, might be wasting time, but I guess we don't know that until we start talking to them. And then how do we vet them or where do we vet them? Do you recommend any good websites to check them out? Yeah. So I would say a few things. Number one, I would strongly encourage you guys to not bump into investors prior to being ready. Um, casual conversations with investors are not good. Like, they really aren't because investors judge, they form an opinion. You may think like it's a friendly conversation, but in the meantime, I analyzed you in the first 10 seconds and decided I will never invest in you. And that may be because you weren't prepared well. So I would really caution you to control the process. So meaning you either raising or you're not, you either prepared or you're not. If you're prepared, then you're happy to take, to take, to take meetings. The other piece that's really important is also, um, uh, you know, you have to become an investor nerd. If you want to be a serious CEO, if you want to be a serious founder, you cannot think of uh, fundraising as a sort of casual activity where you feel helpless. You have to like completely analyze, understand, fully own, uh, and dissect like who is who. So to your question. Should I talk to this person? Well, who are they? Is this a partner? Is this an associate? What firm are they at? What stage are they at? Is it an angel investor? If this is an angel investor, what stage are they investing in? Uh, am I a fit? Uh, and so you just need to become really good at vetting investors and understanding what drives them, what drives people at different stages. And it's, it's really a subject of a whole separate talk, but TLDR, do your homework. Don't let people pull you into the process when you're not ready. Have full control and full full command. Uh, I'm gonna keep rolling. So um, the third rule is you need to focus on one stage at a time. And that is, um, again, something that is counterintuitive um, and, and requires a lot of discipline. But uh, what I hear from the founders is like, look, I had 10,000 visitors, only 10 um, people became my customers. My, my business is terrible. What do I do? Well, I don't know. Maybe your business isn't terrible and maybe 10,000 to 10 is a good conversion rate. I have no idea. But what I do know is that our brains try to go from everything to the bottom of the funnel and like, how do I make the whole thing better? And that is not the move. The move is to really isolate just one stage. And there's amazing examples um, of founders who are like really focused uh, and marketers, product leaders who are really focused on um, fine tuning 
and really understanding how to improve between the two stages. And I'm about to give you guys like super simple and very actionable tools for how to do that. But just understand that instead of focusing on the whole funnel, try to just improve how can I make more meetings convert into a trial? This is a lot more clear and a lot more actionable. What do I do at the meeting that can help me, um, you know, transition from a meeting to a trial? How can I just improve conversion at this stage by 10%? And then obviously, if I can do it in one stage and then I can apply it to other stages, then amazing things happen. But remember, you only tune one stage at a time. So how do you do it? It's exceptionally simple. You use nudges to cause specific actions. So um, the simplest nudge uh, you, can, you can think of is really you just say it. So for example, you're in a meeting with a prospective customer and you want them to do a trial. I'm not joking. You say, can we next do a trial? That's literally a nudge. And hopefully they will say, sure, I'm open to it. And that's the action that they perform. So effectively to move people between stages of the funnel, you use nudges and nudges cause them to perform actions. So let's look at some of the nudges. The simplest nudge you have is literally your homepage, which is why copy is so important. Because guess what? People who come to your website, they just read your copy. And a lot of times they do what you tell them to do. The same thing is true in your apps. So people just show up and they do what you tell them to do. So example, you know, we built a website that provides movie recommendations, sign up and you're going to get movie recommendations. So if I am interested in that, I'm going to sign up and I know exactly what I'm going to get. So that's a nudge and I perform an action. Um, the nudges that we all hate, but totally fall for are marketing emails. Like, hey, today only sweaters are 50% off. And as soon as you see the 50% off, you're like, wow, that's a lot of percent off. Let me click on it and go buy it. Um, the sales are the ultimate nudges that cause us to spend money on things we may or may not need. Um, and then, you know, when you think about a VC world, if you have a term sheet and you're talking to a lot of other VCs, you tell them, by the way, I just got a term sheet. What's your move? And that is the best possible nudge you can tell VCs because they're going to promptly start FOMOing on the deal, right? Like if you said, I got a term sheet, then VCs know they have to hurry up. So you see, not, you need to come up with nudges that then will cause people to perform actions you want them to perform. That's how you move people through stages of the funnel. Let me pause to see if you guys have any questions on this. Okay, I think we're good. Okay, so um final rule is you need to figure out stages of your own funnel so obviously everything that i'm showing you here are not real and they are is this is just like toy funnels the actual funnel of your company especially if you're a b2b sales company or if you, or if you are uh you know a, a consumer uh, a consumer company is so, so, so important. It's literally one of the assets that your company has that has to be talked about and understood, tuned, and protected. And by protected, I mean that if you break it, it's very costly. If you have a sales script for how you sell the product that's effective, and then you hire a new salesperson and she doesn't follow it. That's really costly. If you have an optimized conversion funnel for your customer, for your app, for your website, and then a developer introduces a bug and that funnel is broken, or even worse, when product 
cooks up a redesign thinking they're going to do it better, but they break the entire conversion funnel. That's awful. That's why I'm saying that these funnels are your assets, literally, that, that should be highly protected. Very few companies have this um, you know, visual and language to talk about how important these funnels are. So the truly hard part is knowing what your actual funnel is. So the last tool for funnels that I want to give you is how to discover your own funnel. It's actually pretty straightforward. So if you are an enterprise sales company, you start with a generic funnel. And that's what I'm showing you guys here. So the generic funnel, like you have unqualified leads, you qualify them, then you have a meeting, a trial, paying customer, etc. Now, to really understand where your, so creation of your own funnel is discovering where the biggest drop-offs are and inserting new stages. So let me explain. If I have a huge drop-off between qualified lead and a meeting, I need to then create a new stage. And I need to have a hypothesis as to what that stage should be and how can I reduce the drop-off from qualified lead to a meeting. Or if I have a big drop-off from a trial to a paying customer, then I need more touch points. So specifically, when you're an enterprise company, to make sure you have successful trial, what skilled salespeople do is they create artificial touch points or maybe real touch points. So how they do it is they say, okay, we're going to have a trial. It's going to be six weeks and let's put a meeting on the calendar every two weeks to touch base to see how things are going. Those meetings become stages of your funnel because if your customer isn't showing up to that meeting, they're not going to convert. They're not going to close. You see? So you basically create additional um, stages of the funnel to make sure that you have control over the ultimate conversion. Okay. And then you don't settle never this, this cannot possibly be anyone's funnel. So you have to keep going and keep trying to figure out what stage am I missing? Where, where's my biggest drop off? What nudges can I add? What am I missing? And then you just keep iterating like a sculptor. Like you just keep iterating until you feel like you have really good funnel with like really smooth, really good control. And that's when you, that's when you, you will know it because you will have predictability. When you guys kind of take a bird eye view of a company, how could I possibly forecast my revenue if I don't have predictability on my funnel? I can't. So effectively to, to have an effective forecast, I would have to, I would have to nail my funnel and I would have to be fluent in it and control it. Uh, I'm going to pause. I think there may be some questions in the chat, but I can't really see them. So if anyone wants to read them, please go ahead or maybe um, I'm not really sure if there are questions in there. Uh, nope, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Okay, perfect. Any any questions? All right. I have one, Alex. Okay, go for it. Um, can you gonna give an example of um, inserting a stage between a qualified lead and a meeting? Um, yes, effectively you need to like, I mean, it depends on the nature of your outreach. So let's assume you're doing it via email. Yes. So, um, you probably, it, it's actually much trickier, but effectively, uh, 
my advice would be to um, split, create a split stage, which involves, depending on how far along you're in the business, I would um, augment the email stage with warm intros. So effectively, I would want to test the hypothesis is, is it that you're not writing correct emails or do people just not care about this? Um, and I, I think for the early stage company, just sending these cold emails is, is difficult, but there's other things you can also do. You can run ads. You can also, um, you can also DM people on LinkedIn. So effectively the mechanism of how you outreach is what I would, is what I would test. So it's not really a stage. It's just more like the tactic. Yeah, that helps. And I kind of think of that going from like a meeting to a trial stage. I'm thinking of like people I've reached out to where I'm trying to just like shadow their process. And I guess like a, like similar tactic could be like, do I approach them with something that's of value to them to try to like convert them over to the trial? Is that kind of the right way of thinking of it? Yes. And so every effectively, like all of this has like a lot of nuance, but for example, conversion from meeting to a trial, um, what are the reasons why they will tell you no? Like it could be that they're busy. Uh, they're, they don't have the resources. Um, a lot of times these are actual red flags because it kind of signals that your product may not be that needed. And so I would be concerned typically if someone agrees to a meeting, um, you know, there should be significant conversion to a trial if your product is needed. If it's kind of a nice to have, um, that's where that's where it gets blurry. But the other tool in your arsenal, I think a lot of early stage founders um, aren't, um, I don't want to say forceful, but aren't like prescriptive enough as to how their products are bought. So let me elaborate on this. You know, somebody would say, oh, I'm a little busy, like, you know, maybe come back later or we can start a trial, but I don't know how much I can pay attention to it. And you just say, no, 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 no. My trial is, you know, two weeks or a month. Here's how it works. When you're ready, we will start the trial. Here's what I will need. I will need your engineer to like talk to my engineer for whatever, 30 minutes to set everything up. Uh, once it's set up, we will have a check-in every week. The whole thing is like four weeks and then you guys can come to a decision. And then there's other things. So effectively it's a playbook for how you are willing to run your trial. Now, the problem is a lot of early stage founders agree to a vague trial conditions. Like, oh my God, I was so lucky to get in front of the customer. Whatever they say, I'm gonna go along like, and you don't have control over that process. And that is a waste of your time. Um, I've written another blog post, which basically talks about sequencing of your customers. So effectively, ultimately, if you build a really valuable company, everybody's going to become, majority of people are going to become your customers. So at an early stage, your job is to discover what is the sequencing of your customers, meaning some of them are not ready to buy now. Some of them will be later adapters. Some of them will buy later. So your job is to put them on the spiral that unfolds. So on the inside of the spiral, there are customers that are ready to buy now. On the very outer loops of the spiral, there are customers that are going to buy later. And you as a founder have to have strong gut and intuition. Is this customer going to buy from me now? And what a lot of founders do is they fall into the trap of pursuing customers that are simply not going to buy now. And classic example, as a tiny startup selling into IBM, it's like whale hunting. It's basically impossible, but you still are hopeful because, oh, IBM is talking to me. Maybe they will buy, but the reality is they probably won't 99.9% .9 of the time. So effectively you're wasting time with them. And so it's an art. A lot of the stuff I'm giving you, it's kind of ironic because I'm giving you like 
the grand unified nerdy theory and trying to make it scientific, but there is a whole art at, you know, aspect to it. Like you have to be an artist uh, really making excellent decisions and knowing kind of like, how do I optimize my funnel? Like, where am I missing stages? What am I hearing from this customer? Is this customer the right customer for me right now? So there's a lot of like blurry things and you have to like be awesome at navigating through the blur. All right. Um, so the probably the most important chunk of the talk is uh, this sort of final part uh, around magic moments and business viability. So, um, you know, the super simplified version of what makes uh, for a successful business is you have to acquire customers much cheaper than the amount of money you're going to make on these customers. I'm not talking about sophisticated accounting mathematics. I'm talking about common sense. If you're paying more money to acquire customers than you know the lifetime value of the business, you don't have a viable business. But the point is that uh, the cost of acquisition of customers, even if you drive it to zero, which a lot of um, viral consumer uh, products, whether in CPG or uh, DDC, and even a lot of the B2B products um, that are really good and very viral um, have reduced cost of acquisition just because pe people want them, like Slack. They didn't really advertise much. People just kind of picked it up and, you know, we're, we're all using it uh, or Zoom. Um, but reducing the cost of acquiring customer isn't enough. What it is really all about is the lifetime value. It's about increasing lifetime value. It's about non-churn. So what is the science of non-churn? Well, um, there is this thing that effectively was pioneered by Facebook. Um, and they came up with this concept of a magic moment. And um, it's, it's a bit of a mouthful, but I will give you kind of like a mathematical view of it because I think, I think you know, all of you guys are sophisticated and it's important to understand. So effectively, if you take a basket of customers, let's say 1,000 customers, um, then if all of them reached magic moment state, then most of them won't churn from there and you will have a viable business. So it's a bit of a futuristic visual. Let's say you have built a great company. Let's say you have very viable business. What that means is that most of your customers has, have reached this magic moment. So how do we calculate it? So it's a little bit like blurry because wait, but like this is in the future. What am I supposed to do? Well, the magic moment is achieved by certain actions that customers perform to get into the state. So let me give you concrete examples. So um, Facebook, when it, when, when it launched the feed, it insisted that each one of us has 20 friends. And um, I don't know if you remember that, um, but they were very persistent. And a lot of products nowadays also insist on some similar version of it, like Twitter says, follow 20 people. Um, do you guys know why they did that? You can just shout if you want. I'll take any, I'll take any guesses. Network effects. Network effects, exactly. But how, explain to me the mechanic. What does that mean? Break it down for me. Uh, so when you add each person, it, one makes your company more valuable for investors, um, which you can kind of use to show traction um, to that earlier question, but also because each of those 20 friends then have to uh, add their own 20 friends and then that makes it actually worthwhile. And so then it's sticky for people to want to stay on it, um, but sticking in a different kind of sense. 
Exactly. But now take that concept. So what you said is, is exactly right. But give people the visual of what is the exact mechanic. So start with Alex just sign up for Facebook and my feed is empty. Uh, well, if his feed is empty, he wouldn't find much use in it. But when people start actually posting a picture, then they see the benefit and then they can encourage other people to do the same. Exactly. So if I start, if my feed is empty, I instantly churn. So LTV zero, no reason for me to come back. Now, if I um, have one friend, that friend will post, but how much can they post? It's not interesting enough. So I may react to them, but I don't have an incentive to keep coming back. I want to give you the precise visual. So then another friend that I uh, follow may start posting. Now I like their posts. They're encouraged to post more because I like it. And then I'm also encouraged to post because they will see that I'm posting and, 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 uh, and may like my posts. But at one, two, or three friends, there is not enough content for me to keep coming back. So by the way, that is the violation of viability. You see, it is not viable because when you, if you look up a definition of what viable is, it's actually very important. Viability is ability to, to, to survive and self-perpetuate. So actually product isn't viable when I just have not enough friends. So the true number that, you know, nerds at Facebook calculated was actually like 16.7, but we don't have that measure of human beings on this planet. You can't have 16.7 people. So Facebook marketers were like, great, we'll just round it up to 20 and call it a day. So the actual graph theoretic answer was like, you need to have 16.7 or whatever friends. So the point is, they invented the system, they pioneered this notion that um, once you create enough content, uh, people will just keep coming back because it's just a self-sustained system. And the key thing for you guys to remember, there is a feedback loop. So at the heart of magic moments, there are feedback loops. So let's look at some, some other examples. Um, you know, recall when you first got your mobile phone, what was the magic moment? No wrong answers. What's the magic moment of the mobile phone? I don't know if you guys remember, but when Steve Jobs was presenting it, um, he flickered, he basically kept scrolling. It's the scroll, it's the, in, the frictionless infinite scroll. We're information junkies. This is ultimate infinite, information paradise is just so easy everything at your fingertips your favorite apps but it's the act of scrolling think about it in the physical world we have to pay the cost of energy to move stuff around in the digital world it's frictionless scrolling and our brains are so fired up because of that it's like let me do another scroll let me do another scroll just another scroll because it's just so frictionless um think about netflix What's the what's the magic moment for Netflix? It just tells you what you should watch. It tells you what you should watch. So it makes it really easy to find the next thing. But there is another thing that it does. What else does it do? More Let content you can a, actually watch. More content to watch. Let me let me let me see if this resonates. It's midnight and you know you should go to bed um, because you have to get up early next morning and the episode is ending. And then it says the next episode starts in three, two, one, and then it just goes. Guess what? You did not get up off that couch. You probably forgot this, but Netflix pioneered binge watching. Remember, we lived in the world of linear television where every Sunday we waited for the next Game of Thrones. 
that's gone. That is gone. We don't, we don't have that anymore. Nobody does that that way anymore. Netflix invented binge watching and binge watching is an intimate, you know, is the ultimate feedback loop because our brains are addicted to storytelling. So we just want to keep going. We just want to, to see what happens. We just want to watch the next episode. So for business software, it's not too dissimilar. Effectively, magic moment um, is a moment of utility. It's a moment of feedback. It is something that makes your life easy, like superhuman. Uh, it's an email app that has a lot of shortcuts and auto completion. Why do you like? Makes your life easier. Who likes email? Nobody. And so it effectively reduces the amount of time you need to spend on email. So great software has features and tools and utility to basically help us um, do our, you know, do our jobs better, and therefore we like it. So. Magic moments are effectively moments of satisfaction. It's a certain state where we're like really excited. And how do we get to that state? Well, we start by trying out the product, then we keep coming back. And so the hint is it's a set of repetitive actions, whether it's scroll on the phone or next episode on Netflix or in superhuman, it's some sort of repetitive gestures that you do when you reply to email. So effectively, whatever you're building, if you're building a CPG company, the repetitive gesture has to be a rewarder or a subscription because people really like what you've built. You really like your product. So how do you find the magic moment for your startup? Well, again, there is no science. There's really a lot of it is art, but the good news is now that you guys taken my workshop, you know you have to look for it. So you're way ahead of the game compared to everybody else. People don't even think about it. You would be shocked how many startups literally randomly stumbled upon their magic moments. They weren't necessarily deliberate about it. They didn't think of it as science, um, but, you can. And so effectively, how do you figure it out? It's you need to start by thinking what is the core utility that your product delivers? And what is the and what is the viable um, kind of set of actions that the user needs to be performing on your product to make sure they keep coming back every day? What what job are you doing for them? that makes their life easier. And then you need to use the funnels knowledge that we talked about to keep optimizing and fine tuning. But the things that we know for a fact, if people can't latch on, they're, they're you're not gonna reach the magic moment. If people try your product and then leave, you're not gonna reach your magic moment. So magic moment is a set of things that people do every week and also a set of things that they would do once they just discover your product. Yeah, Cecilia. Hey, Alex, quick question. Um, when it comes to B2B products, do we have any examples of magic moments? Is it sort of the set of actions that your customers need to take for them to really adopt the product? Okay. It is. It, it really highly depends, but for ex there's, there's different types of enterprise products. Increasingly, uh, when you think about AI or things that just run on autopilot, uh, those products just do the work for customers. So that's kind of like ambient magic moments. But uh, in case of Superhuman, which is basically an enterprise product, um, you know, you you use it to orchestrate your email workflow. But if you're building, um, for example, if you're building an API-based company, like you're a developer tool, the magic moment is integration. So it really depends on the type of company you're building. So for example, if you tell me what your startup does, I can kind of, you know, start guessing and start becoming intelligent about like what the magic moment would be. Yeah, sure. So I guess my startup is on um, AI cloud optimization. So it's software that helps enterprises um, make better use of the cloud services that they're getting from the public cloud. So like Amazon, Microsoft, Google. Right. So effectively, we know that 
you, 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 you will basically have a fairly sophisticated magic moment because it will involve an ROI. It will involve financial stakeholders. It will also involve engineers. So at the very minimum, you're going to need your product to be configured on your cloud. The analysis would have to run, run continuously. Then you will have to present some sort of report and recommendation. That recommendation would need to be implemented and then the financial stakeholder will have to make a determination. So all of those things would, you know, if I understood you correctly, would be ingredients into your magic moment.